What I want to talk about tonight is, might be thought of, or at least I think of it as, what we should be worried about in international finance and the international economy more generally. That's a very broad topic. I'm going to zero in on one topic to start with, which is the crisis in the Eurozone, and then start to, to suggest some broader implications of that crisis for our thinking about the international financial system. So let me start with the Eurozone crisis. I start with the Eurozone crisis for a variety of reasons. First of all, there is little doubt that the most troubling aspect of the international economy today is the ongoing crisis in the Eurozone. This is the region of the world which has suffered most from the great financial crisis that began in 2007. It is the region that has recovered least from that crisis. In fact, the Eurozone remains mired in the aftermath of the crisis. From the standpoint of the European Union itself, this is unquestionably the most serious crisis in the history of European integration since World War II. It calls into question the future of the entire project of European integration, from the Euro through the European Union more generally, and raises important questions and issues about where Europe is going. The European economy is the second largest economy in the world in some sense, when you're thinking of the European economy as a whole. The fact that it is still mired eight years after the crisis began, in serious, serious economic difficulties, has dragged down the rest of the world and suggests that without a, a substantial recovery in Europe, it will be difficult for the rest of the world economy to get going in the way that we would like to see it uh, develop. What I want to do to start off with then is to talk a bit about how and why this crisis in the, Euro, in the Eurozone took place, about the aftermath of the crisis and what some of its broader implications are. Now, in looking at the Eurozone crisis, I think it's important to understand that it is a part of a global phenomenon that characterized the world economy and the world financial system in the 10 or so years after the year 2000. For those 10 years, really from 1999, let's say, until about 2008, the world economy was organized in a very unusual way, a way that had not been seen before. And that is that the world economy was divided into two broad groups of countries. One broad group of countries, uh, realized its economic growth primarily by borrowing from the rest of the world in order to finance an expansion of consumption. That was what we in the United States did, the United Kingdom, um, many what, what I will be calling peripheral Europe, which is everything from Ireland through Spain, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and then Central and Eastern Europe. These are countries that borrowed very heavily, many trillions of dollars from the rest of the world, and used those borrow, borrowed funds to expand their consumption in a variety of ways. In some instances, the borrowed funds were used to finance budget deficits, but in most cases, including in the United States, the borrowed funds were used to finance an expansion of household consumption, especially in housing markets. So one large group of countries is growing rapidly by borrowing from the rest of the world and expanding its consumption. Another large group of countries is growing just as rapidly in many instances, and the engine of their economic growth is selling to the consumers. So Germany, China, Japan, the Arab oil producing countries are selling their goods to the big consumers and growing as a result. Ironically, they're lending the consumers the money to buy their products. So the Germans are lending the Spaniards the money to buy German products. The Japanese and the Chinese are lending America the, the money to buy their products. And that's the way the world economy worked for almost 10 years. Well, that division of the world eventually led to the debt crisis that we began living at the end of 2007. Because the expansion of consumption in the borrowing countries gave rise to a boom, and then a bubble, and eventually the bubble burst. This is really an unprecedented event. It's the first time in modern world history that a whole group of rich countries have had simultaneous debt crises. There have been individual debt crises in individual rich countries, Probably the most striking one was that that hit Germany in 1929. Didn't end well. But this is the first time that a whole group of developed countries have entered, entered into a serious debt crisis together. And it's not entirely clear whether and how they'll come out of it. So that's the broad picture. I want to talk now about specific, the specifics of the Eurozone. The Eurozone process, of course, is similar in that there are massive flows of capital, massive lending from northern European countries to peripheral European countries. And again, when I, I, sometimes people talk about Southern Europe, but Ireland was one of the big borrowers, and Poland, and the 
Baltic states were big bars, and they're not southern. So I prefer to call them peripheral because it's, the, it's sort of that crescent that runs from Ireland through Spain and Portugal, Italy, Greece, and then <coughs> many of the Balkans, Poland, Czech Republic through the Baltics. So very large capital flows from Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, to some extent France, to peripheral European countries, which led to a big expansion of consumption, especially in housing markets, a big housing bubble in those countries, which eventually burst, uh, leaving the European economy with the kind of debt overhang, debt crisis that we experienced in the US. So it's part of the broad phenomenon. But there are many important Eurozone particulars. So I'm going to spend some time going through what it was about the construction of the Euro that determined the course of the crisis and that contributes to it being so difficult to resolve. At the time the Euro was introduced in 1999, it had been in planning stages really for 30 years. The Europeans began talking about monetary integration in 1969 in the with the Warner Report. So this is something that Europeans had long anticipated and worked towards. And nothing I say about the crisis and about the failings of the euro itself should take away from the fact that, or should imply, that I think that the euro was a bad idea. I'm agnostic on the, on the fact. In fact, I think there, we can look at it and say there were some very strong reasons why member states of the European Union insisted on creating a common currency. And if people are interested, we could talk about that. But the, the fact is that by the time the euro was established in 1999 and then put into place in physical uh, properties as, as a currency in 2001, by the time it was established, it was well understood that the member states of the, the eurozone lacked certain characteristics that one would want to see in a common currency. In other words, analysts, economists, and political economists and others identify a series of gaps, or if you want it to be a little more judgmental, flaws in the construction of the euro that turned out to be crucial to the way the crisis developed. And there were four principal flaws, four principal gaps. Flaws, as I say, sounds judgmental. They, tur they turned out to be crucial to the crisis. If you ask why was it that these flaws were allowed to persist, Again, we have to go back to why the Europeans wanted the euro in the first place. I can tell you, just uh, uh, anecdotally, I was involved in working with and talking to many policymakers at the time in the run-up to the, the introduction of the euro in 1999. And when these issues were brought to them, the almost universal response was, we understand it's a problem, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. What eventually turned out to be the case is when they came to it, there wasn't a bridge. So they ended up in the, in the sink. And but it, it, there was no question that there was a recognition of the problems with the construction of the euro, even from the very earliest stages of its construction. So let me go through these four <coughs> factors that contributed to the crisis. The first factor is the existence of very substantial macroeconomic differences among the countries that constitute the eurozone with a common central bank. So just like in the United States, you have one central bank with one monetary policy, one interest rate, one currency, and yet you have massive divergences among the member countries, divergences that are much greater than those among the regions of the United States. And I'm going to use as an example, without picking, trying not to pick on any country, I'm going to use as an example Germany as representative of northern European countries, and Spain as a representative of the peripheral <coughs> European countries. So at the time the euro was introduced, the German economy is stagnant. The Spanish economy is growing. It's not growing that rapidly, but it's certainly growing more rapidly than the German economy. So you have a central bank, the European Central Bank, that has designed a common monetary policy for a stagnant Germany and a reasonably rapidly growing Spain. How do you do that? If the appropriate interest rate for Germany is 1% low to try to stimulate the economy, but the appropriate interest rate for Spain is 5%, what do you do? Well, the European Central Bank did what most central bankers would do and choose something in between, 3%. Right? Which meant that the interest rate for Germans was relatively high, the interest rates for Spaniards was relatively low. As this, the rate of growth in Spain meant that prices were rising in Spain at the rate of about 3 or 4% a year, while prices in Germany were flat. So if you think of what it looks like to a German where prices are flat and interest rates are 3% is lending might be a pretty good idea because you can earn 3% when investments in Germany aren't earning anything. If you're sitting in Spain 
and, it, and prices are rising 4% a year, and the interest rate is 3%, you can borrow for nothing. You've got negative real interest rates. So you start with this macroeconomic divergence and a common monetary policy, and that leads to incentives for people in Germany, Northern Europe, to lend to people in Southern Europe, and incentives for people in Southern Europe, Spain, to borrow. You start there, and as capital starts flowing from Germany to Spain, it exacerbates or accentuates the process. The more money is lent from Germany to Spain, the more rapidly the Spanish economy starts growing. The more rapidly the Spanish economy starts growing, the more prices start rising. And especially, prices of the things that most people are using the borrowed funds to buy, which is housing. So as more money, so the German, German banks lend money to Spanish banks, the Spanish banks lend money to Spanish homeowners, and you start to get a big uptick in housing prices in Spain. The Spanish banks say, Gee, this is a great deal. Housing prices are rising 10, 15, 20 percent a year. Let me make more housing loans. And they go to the German banks and say, lend us more money. And the Germans say, geez, the German housing market is stagnant. Actually, housing prices are falling in Germany. We're not going to make any real estate loans in Germany. We're going to do it in Spain. So the German banks lend to the Spanish banks, which lend to the Spanish homeowners. And it's a self-reinforcing process, which goes on for almost 10 years until it doesn't go on anymore. That's, so that's the first characteristic of the Eurozone, to keep in mind. The macroeconomic divergence is with a common monetary policy. Second, as soon as the Euro is created, almost immediately, a, a common financial system develops. Because with a common currency, it really doesn't matter, matter whether the money is being lent from Germany to Belgium, Belgium to Italy, Italy to Spain. It's a common financial system, just like in the United States. But each national authority exercises regulatory competence over its own banks. So there's a single financial market, but the Spanish government has its own regulations, and the Italian government has its own regulations, and the German government has its own regulations. And if you're a smart banker, you find the best regulations for your purposes. And you can use your clever lawyers and accountants to find your way through all the various regulations of the 12 original members and send money to where it's least regulated. Or try to prevail on the regulators to relax regulations. So in the case of Spain, the Spanish government actually originally had fairly stringent regulations, but as money starts flooding in, the Spanish banks prevail on the Spanish government to relax those regulations to allow them to borrow a lot more money and lend a lot more money. So you have what we would call regulatory arbitrage. As It, it would be as if each, each American state does have its own regulators, but it would be as if the American regulators of each state had complete independence to design any financial regulations they want. So you have this fragmentation of regulation, which allows banks to evade regulations in their home countries and find places where they can lend where they might not otherwise be allowed to do so. Third feature of the Eurozone. As this, these divergences grow, if there had been a common government as we have in the United States, one way that that's dealt with or the Europeans could have dealt with it, is by using fiscal policy to counteract the divergences that were erupting or that were developing between the two regions. So again, taking, without picking on them, Germany and Spain as examples, if we're worried that Germany is stagnant and, and getting more so and Spain is growing and growing and you've got a, a housing bubble developing in Spain and capital flooding in, how do you counteract that? Well, if there had been a common agreement on common fiscal policies, the German government could have run stimulative fiscal policies to encourage investment in Germany. The Spanish government could have run retractionary or contractionary fiscal policies to try to slow down economic growth in Spain. But there was no fiscal coordination among the member states. The Spanish government on its own had no incentive to try to slow down a boom. No one wants to, in Bill Martin's terms, no one wants to take away the punch bowl just as the party gets started. Right? The German government didn't want to uh, anger its constituents and taxpayers by raising taxes or, or, or making un undertaking deficit spending, which is very unpopular in Germany. So fiscal coordination among the member states was non-existent. So that couldn't counteract this bubble that was developing. And then finally, and as it turns out in some ways most strikingly, there was, and I'll say the phrase and then talk about it a bit, there was a no bailout commitment that was not credible. So what does that mean? That means at the start of the euro, for the member states said, if one country gets in trouble, we are not going to bail them out. No one's going to bail anyone out. 
if Spain gets in trouble, we're not going to be bailed out. If Italy gets in trouble, they're not going to be bailed out. And they said it over and over and over again. They wrote it into the laws. They pronounced it from the rooftops. And nobody believed them. Right. Nobody. The markets said, if there's a financial crisis in one member state, it's all one currency. It's all one central bank. They can't ignore it. They're going to have to bail them out. There has to be a bailout. This, this notion that there will not be a bailout of a single country getting into crisis is not credible. We are going to assume that any country that gets in trouble will be bailed out. And how we know that this is what the markets thought is by looking at interest rates, spreads, spreads on lending to governments. In 1999, 1998, before the euro was introduced, the Greek government paid about six percentage points more than the German government to borrow, right? which was appropriate because the Greek government had a long-standing history of not running its finances very carefully. Right? And the German government, on the other hand, had a long-standing history of running its finances very carefully. The day the euro was introduced, within weeks, the spread between German and Greek borrowing, that is what the markets charged the Greek government, went to about, point, to about a fifth of a percentage point, 20 basis points. That is, the German government could effectively borrow at the same interest rate as the German government. And so could the Portuguese government, and the Spanish government, the Italian government. So the markets priced in the expectation that if there were a financial crisis in one member state, it would be bailed out by the other member states. What that meant was that not only could individuals, households in Greece or Spain or, or <coughs> Ireland borrow for next to nothing, governments could too. Governments could effectively borrow with German creditworthiness even if they really didn't have the credibility of the German government. So if you put those four factors together, what you get is a process whereby this ma these macroeconomic divergences are accentuated by huge flows of funds, trillions of dollars lent from Northern Europe to peripheral Europe, funding budget deficits in some cases, but primarily a housing bubble that makes our housing bubble look tiny. I was in Ireland, in Dublin, in 2000, end of 2006, beginning of 2007. Dublin is a small city on a, a flat plain, no constraints on new construction, wandering around a middle class neighborhood south of where I was at Trinity College. There were in the estate agent's windows, you could see ads for modest two bedroom homes, homes for one and a half million euros, two million dollars. The average house price in Dublin was higher in 2007 than the average house price in New York City, where I come from. This was clearly a bubble. There had been a 250% increase in housing prices over the previous decade in Ireland, and it was fueled by this rapid flow of funds into the country. The same thing was true in Spain, in Portugal, in, in country after country. Of course, as we know, this, as this expansion turned into a boom, then into a bubble, eventually the bubble burst. <laughs> And the Europeans have, to, have had to live with the aftermath of the crisis. The recovery has been extraordinarily slow. In the average recession, in the European case, typically employment and output returns to pre-recession levels within 9 to 12 months. Today, we have, Europe has gone through, by some counts, its third recession in eight years. Economic output is still below where it was in, 19, in, in, in 2007. And I was talking to some students before and pointing out that if we compare the current crisis to the Great Depression of the 1930s, Europe is actually doing worse today than it did in the 1930s. That is, by nine, seven years after the crisis began in 1929, in 1936, the European economies had recovered to about, as, as a whole, to about 2 or 3% above where they were in 1929. Today, European output is 5 or 6% below where it was in 2007. So in the aggregate, the, the trajectory of European economies today is, has been worse than it was during the 1930s Great Depression. Why does this look like such a different kind of crisis? Why does it not look like a cyclical recession? Because it's not a cyclical recession, it's a debt crisis. It's a debt crisis like we've come to know and worry about in countries like Thailand or Argentina or Brazil or Mexico or Malaysia, mostly developing countries. Most of the de debt crises in history, really, going back to the 19th century, are in poor countries. But these are, this is a wave of debt crises 
in some of the world's richest countries. And debt crises are different. They're different for economic reasons, and they're different for political reasons. The economic reasons have to do with what we call the debt overhang. That is, that a debt crisis leaves a society with a, a burden of accumulated debts, a burden that weighs down on economic growth and recovery. And to understand how it weighs down on economic growth and recovery, we can think of it from the standpoint of the creditors, the people who have lent the money, or from the standpoint of the debtors, those who have borrowed the money. From the standpoint of the creditors, what we have, and this is true of the United States as well, what we have is these are financial institutions that have lent trillions of dollars, some of which they know to be bad, and much of, the, much of which they are very concerned may be bad. So if you're a financial institution that has made enormous loans, undoubtedly far more than your capital, and you know that a lot of those loans are bad, and you know that there are loans that you don't know are bad that are probably bad, what you're most concerned to do is to pull in your lending, pull in your horns, to rebalance your balance, your portfolio, to deleverage, right? to get rid of the bad loans, try to fob them off on some uh, venture capitalist who's willing to take a risk, or on the government, if the government has guaranteed some of them, or just let them drain off the books. The last thing you want to do is make new loans to risky borrowers. So, in the context of this debt overhang, the financial institutions aren't lending. What they're primarily doing is deleveraging, getting rid of their loans rather than making new loans. And the unwillingness of financial institutions to make new loans, again, is a drag on recovery. Even if the recession's over, even if the recovery has begun, if the financial institutions aren't extending credit, growth is going to be, is going to be stunned. From the standpoint of the debtors, you have more or less the mirror image. The debtors have experienced a whole series of shocks. They may have experienced unemployment. Unemployment is very high in Europe. Their incomes have probably uh, declined. Their assets, their savings have gone way down in value. Their homes have gone way down in value. So they have a lower level of earnings, but they still have these high debts. The debts have not been reduced in value. Their savings have been reduced in value. Their homes have been reduced in value. Their income has been reduced in average terms in value, but their debts stay the same. The only way they can service those debts is by consuming less and putting aside some of that consumption to service the, the debts that they owe. So households have to respond to this debt overhang by reducing consumption. So the financial institutions aren't lending, and consumers aren't spending. Economically, in other words, the debt overhang constrains both lending and spending and holds back the economy. But there's a political angle to a debt crisis, which, in my view, is even more daunting and even more problematic. And that is that debt crises pretty much always and everywhere lead to massive political conflict. They lead to massive political conflict because they present society with a highly political question. Who's going to pay to deal with these accumulated debts? Who's going to make the sacrifices necessary to get the economy back on the right track? This is especially difficult when, as is the case in Europe and in most other of the major debtor countries, when we're talking about international debts, foreign debts. Because then you have two dimensions of political conflict. You have the international dimension and the domestic dimension. Internationally, a debt crisis, and we know this from Latin America, East Asia, Africa, Asia, now from Europe, an international debt crisis sets creditor countries against debtor countries with very clear interests. The creditor countries want to get paid back. The debtor countries want to pay as little as possible. The creditor countries say, as, would, as uh, Calvin Coolidge said about the Europeans in the 20s, they hired the money, didn't they? The creditor countries say, you said you were going to pay us this back. We want to get paid back. Why should our taxpayers take the hit? Why should our banks take the hit? The debtor countries say, yes, we borrowed irresponsibly, but you lent irresponsibly. There are two sides of this transaction. We, want to, we need to distribute the burden. We'll take some of the hit, but your banks have to take some of the hit as well. And that conflict has gone on now for eight years in Europe, setting Germany against Portugal, the Netherlands against Spain, France against Greece, country against country, over who's going to pay for the inevitable restructuring of these debts. That is exacerbated by domestic political conflict over the same issue. Because 
Forget about Germany versus Greece or Belgium versus Spain. Who in Spain is going to fit the bill for these debts? Is it going to be Spanish taxpayers? Is it going to be Spanish homeowners? Is it going to be Spanish banks? Is it going to be government employees in Spain? Is it going to be beneficiaries of government programs in Spain? The same thing is true in Germany or in the Netherlands. If the German, if, if in these international negotiations, Germany does decide to restructure some of this debt, who's going to pay for the difference? Is it going to come out of the bankers themselves? Is it going to come out of the German taxpayer's pocket? Is it going to come out of the pocket of German government employees, salaries reduced to try to make up some of the difference? So domestically, there are conflicts over who will bear the burden of adjustment, just as there are internationally. And this is often, this conflict is very often made even more intense by the very broad feeling, often accurate, that the people who are being asked to sacrifice in the crisis are not the people who benefited during the upturn. So we, this is true in the United States. We had a lot of conflict over the fact that a lot of people in America felt that the beneficiaries of the borrowing boom between 2001 and 2007 were not the people who were paying the principal price for the turndown after 2007. In Europe, it's the same. People all over Europe, especially in peripheral Europe, are complaining that they're being asked to undergo very, very difficult austerity measures even though they didn't benefit from what got the country into the crisis in the first place. It reminds me of my experience in Latin America, where I spent a lot of time and studied a lot of debt crises. I was in Brazil in 1983, when the then military president of Brazil went on television, made a very famous speech in which this was imposing very severe austerity measures. And he said, to justify these measures, he said, Brazilians need to understand the party is over. And the next day, there were massive demonstrations on the streets of Sao Paulo and Rio. And the banners read, the party's over, and we weren't even invited. <laughs> and that was the general feeling in many Latin American countries, and it is the general feeling in many European countries today, that there was this massive party and expansion of lending, and the people who were being asked to pay the bill are not primarily those who benefited from the party. So, what we've observed in Europe has been a continual series of rounds of bargains, negotiations, and conflicts among countries, within countries, and virtually none of them have, read to, have led to any substantive conclusion. We think that politics in the US is gridlocked and hamstrung. We look like an ideal candidate for democratic functionality compared to Europe, because the Europeans have effectively restructured almost no debts, with the exception of Greece, which was a special case. They have arrived at virtually no common decisions on how to deal with the crisis. The situation in Europe is as unsettled today as it was in 2010, when the sovereign debt crisis erupted. The European political system, the, Europe, the, the political system of the European Union, has effectively failed to find any substantial uh, resolution to the crisis. And to be honest, shows no real signs of overcoming its failure. And that's why so many people in Europe are so worried about what this crisis means for the future of the European Union. Um, so, some implications. First, for the European Union and for the Eurozone, I think most people believe that the Europeans will be able to, as they often have, muddle through this crisis, that gradually, in part because of the passage of time, and because of recovery in other parts of the world, there will be a, a, a recovery in the European economy. There's a the beginning of recovery already. And that gradually they will work their way through. Now, that is not that is better news than the alternative, but it's not good news. The Europeans will have lost, really, when we talk about the Latin Americans losing a decade, Japan losing a decade, the Europeans will have lost really two decades. Because any of the gains made between 2000 and 2007 were wiped out by the recession. And it is likely that the current decade will show almost no economic growth. So we're talking really about 20 years of economic failure with very serious implications for the future. The scariest number I know this was, was pointed out to me by a, a Spanish former graduate student of mine who's currently in Spain. Uh, youth unemployment in Spain is 50%. So unemployment is 25%. Youth unemployment is 50%. Female youth unemployment, youth being 18 to 24, 
is 60%. And what Pepe told me is you have to realize what that means is that two-thirds of young Spanish women have never had a job. And we know that the first 10 years in the labor force really, in many ways, determine lifetime earnings. So in some sense, we're talking about a lost generation of people, a generation of people coming out of high school or college, wherever they are, and going five, six, seven, eight years without being able to find work. So this is almost certain to have long-term negative effects on the economies of Europe, but also on the social structures. And the unfortunate fact is that, muddled through or not, the Europeans have not resolved the fundamental political impasse, which remains. There have been a series of temporary measures. The ECB has undertaken a whole series of economic policies, many of them quite laudable. There has been some agreement on financial re-regulation, what the Europeans call banking, banking union. Um, all of these are steps in the right direction, I think most would agree, but the politics is still not worked out. There still is no agreement on who should pay, on who should deal with crises of this nature. And unless the underlying political disagreements are resolved, the next crisis, and there will be a next crisis, threatens to be just as contentious and maybe even more so. There are also some broader political implications. Debt crises typically, now there is 200 years of historical evidence that's been looked at quite systematically, lead to political polarization. They tend to make people dissatisfied with democratic political institutions. They tend to drive people towards the extreme right or the extreme left. And we have certainly seen that in Europe. There is a relatively strong neo-Nazi party in Greece for the first time in many, many years. There are strong, it, it is entirely plausible that the National Front in France, um, which was 10 years ago would have been considered a joke, uh, may win the next election in France. It certainly came in first in the most recent European Parliament elections. Um, it, is in it is not only plausible, but it has been the case that what was regarded as an extreme left party in Greece took office, is now in power, and there is the prospects of something similar happening, happening in Spain. In addition to this polarization, there is also, being picked up in all the public opinion surveys, an increasing dissatisfaction with democracy per se, not only with European integration, but with the political system of democracy. It used to be the case that if you ask me, this is almost a motherhood and apple pie question, you ask people, do you think democracy works in your country? And 80, 85, 90% of the populations of every Western European country would say yes. Now, there are countries where it's below 60% and heading south. If you're sitting in Spain with 25% unemployment, and the government's not really doing anything about it, or in uh, some of the Eastern European countries that are experiencing similar things, and you feel that democratically elected governments are not doing anything about your circumstances, you're probably one of those 35 or 40 percent that are saying the democratic system is not working. So not to paint too drastic a picture, we're not going back to the 1930s, at least I'm quite sure we're not going back to the 1930s, but the, the broader political and social implications are very worrisome. So that's Europe. Let me, on that happy note, um, move on to some broader or more general considerations, because I think the, Euro, the Eurozone crisis brings to the fore some issues that are worthy of attention in the international economy and the international financial system more generally. Just as the Eurozone crisis was part of a broader global phenomenon, the implications of the crisis are also broader. And I guess where, where I would start is by pointing out that we now have experienced repeated instances in which countries have experienced very large scale flows of capital, trillions of dollars. Not, you know, back when I was in graduate school, we thought it was a lot when Mexico was borrowing a billion dollars or two billion dollars. Now we're talking about hundreds of billions, trillions of dollars. So countries and regions have experienced enormous capital flows, and they have not ended well. A crisis in the US, a crisis in the Eurozone, in Central and Eastern Europe, in the United Kingdom, repeated instances of massive gross capital flows. And this suggests, at least to me, that there is something fundamental, structural, in a sense systemic, to be concerned about. Now, let me be clear. 
Um, unlike Shakespeare or Polonius, I guess, I don't think borrowing in and of itself is a bad thing. In a sense, in a way, we want and need international capital flows. We need international financial markets. In fact, from a broad human, and human humanitarian, global standpoint, the biggest problem in the world is not too much finance, but too little. There are billions of people in poor countries that can't borrow. Farmers that can't borrow to improve their land. Shopkeepers that can't borrow to get more inventory. So borrowing in itself is not a bad thing. No one worries if Ford borrows a billion dollars in order to expand production. So I, I'm, nothing that I say is meant to imply that borrowing in itself is a bad, is a bad thing. We want international capital flows to move money from where it is less needed to where it's more needed. But over the past 15 years, actually you can go back over the past 150 years, we have seen instances in which these international financial flows create the potential for problems. And I'm going to illustrate this with just a couple of vignettes to, to make the broader point. The first vignette is the one that I've been talking about, that is going back to the think, forgetting about the Eurozone specifically and talking about the broad features of that cycle that we observed starting in 1999. It was a global cycle. It affected the US, it affected the European Union, it affected countries around the world. And that the, the general feature of that boom-bust cycle was that where there were, you have these huge capital markets, these huge international financial markets, searching for yield, trying to find ways to increase their earnings. And that means that they will respond instantaneously with enormous amounts of money to relatively small differences in macroeconomic conditions. Just like in Europe, where you had, you started with relatively small differences between Germany and Spain, and capital floods into Spain, you had something similar at the global level. Relatively small differences in underlying yield or macroeconomic conditions between the U.S. and other countries, capital starts flooding into the U.S. So these flows of funds mean that as the international financial markets respond to these relatively small differences, they increase the differences, which leads to credit booms and eventually busts. So the boom-bust cycle, which has been known in international finance really since the 1830s and 40s, one of the first of them, by the way, was the American states in the 1830s and 1840s. So the, this boom-bust cycle is something that previously seemed to be limited to developing countries. We were a developing country then, so it seemed to be limited to developing countries. We know we've gone through from in the 1870s, 1890s, 1920s, 1930s, 1980s, we had Latin America, East Asia, other developing countries going through these kinds of boom-bust cycles. But what we've seen in the last 15 years is rich countries going through them. The US, the UK, Spain, going through the same kind of Latin American style, not too not the, not, no offense meant to Latin America, the same kind of Latin American style cycle of huge amounts of money flooding into the country, leading to an expansion of consumption, leading to a boom, leading to a bubble, which then bursts. So that's the first exhibit, or the first vignette. The second is what happened after 2008 in the emerging markets, which is the new name for the better off developing countries. Um, so after 2008, interest rates in the developed world pretty much went down to zero. So we're in what's sometimes called ZERP, the zero interest rate period policy. So interest rates are at the zero lower, zero percent lower bound. Can't go lower. Well, they actually can go lower than that. And some of the European countries now are paying negative interest rates. But by 2009, interest rates are down at zero in pretty much all the developed countries. Well, if you're an investor, zero doesn't look too good. Right? So immediately, in the midst of this crisis, investors in the developed world start searching for yield. They start looking for places where they can put their money that can earn more than zero percent. It's not hard to find places that earn more than your zero percent, especially because there are lots of countries in the developing world that continue to grow. And so capital floods into the emerging markets, into Malaysia, Thailand, Mexico, Peru, Brazil, right? in quantities never imagined before. Uh, if you, even just looking at 15, the 15 leading emerging markets, 
over the 2009 to 2013 or so period, there were quarters in which lending was running at the rate of a trillion dollars a year, which was five, six, seven times anything ever seen in flows of capital to developing countries. Actually, for those interested in, in these issues, there's, there's a very important component part of this, which is for, from time immemorial, developing countries had only, had only been able to borrow in foreign currencies. So if you're sitting in Peru, or in Malaysia, or in Brazil, you're the government of those countries, the only way you can borrow is borrowing in dollars. Well, investors in the North, investors in North America and Western Europe, were so desperate for yield that they started buying real, peso, sol, ringgit denominated debt. So the Malaysian government, the Thai government, the Peruvian government are issuing their own bonds in their own national currency, and American and Japanese and German investors are buying them. So for the first time in history, these governments are able to borrow in their own currency and borrow enormous amounts. Um, countries like Malaysia, Thailand, Brazil, Mexico, in the space of five years, borrowed amounts equal to between a third and a half of their GDPs in just a few years. And they weren't in the midst of big crisis. This is, this is money they were borrowing while they were growing very rapidly. So, good news, they, they can borrow enormous amounts. Sovereigns, governments can borrow in their own currency. But along with governments borrowing their own currency, corporations in these countries are, are borrowing, and they can only borrow in dollars or euros, especially in dollars. So you have, if you look at these 15 countries, their governments owe about a, bill, a trillion and a half dollars in their own local currencies, but their corporations owe about $4 trillion in dollars. Economies boom, everything's going along well, until 2013 comes along and the Fed starts talking about, well, maybe we're recovering and maybe the U.S. economy doesn't need zero interest rates anymore and maybe we'll start raising interest rates sometime in the future. We're going to be patient for now, but maybe we'll start raising interest rates sometime in the future. And the markets say, whoa, if they're going to be raising interest rates in the future, I better get some. And $5 trillion floods out of the emerging markets and into the U.S. dollar. The dollar skyrockets. The, these currencies collapse, right, and they find themselves in big trouble. Why do they find themselves in? Take, take the case of Brazil. The Brazilian real, the currency, a trillion, uh, in the case of, of Brazil, somewhere between half a trillion and a trillion dollars has come in. Four of the private companies owe it. It's in dollars. The real is very strong. The cheapest thing in Brazil is, is the dollar. You can buy dollars for nothing. All of a sudden, you have what's called this, this what was called at the time the taper tantrum because the Fed was talking about tapering its, its uh, quantitative easing. And money floods out of Brazil, and the real drops 30%. And all these corporations that are earning reals but have to pay back in dollars find that their real debt burden has increased 25, 30, 40%. And there's a wave of bankruptcies which threatens the entire Brazilian economy. And puts the Brazilian economy, and not just the Brazilian, but many of these emerging market economies, in a position that's pretty similar to where the Spanish and other governments found themselves after 2009. Currencies collapsing, growing debt burdens, bankruptcies, defaults in the private sector, many of which have to be picked up by the government. So the, the, this is an example, again, of international financial markets, which created enormous opportunities for developing countries made it possible for these countries to borrow enormous amounts and in some cases use the money wisely, but which also then, because of these rapid flows of funds, creates very, very serious problems that the countries have to uh, confront. It, it, there is a, the, the old saying about international financial markets and international financial flows is that they make the good times better but the bad times worse. And the way Ragnar Nurksi, who was the chief economist of the League of Nations, talked about this in the aftermath of the experience of the 1920s and 1930s, I think it is probably pretty close to being accurate today. He said, the experience of the past 20 years shows that international finance is like an umbrella that you get, lent, that you get to hold, gets lent to you when the weather is good and gets taken away as soon as it starts to rain. So the common thread that runs through all these examples is that, in my mind, is that today's international financial system makes enormous cross-border flows of capital likely, even almost inevitable, 
in response to very small incentives. And that creates some great opportunities. It means that countries that do have lots of developmental prospects now have access to flow up to funds that they wouldn't have had access to 10, 15, or 15, 20, 25 years ago. But these capital flows can easily create the conditions for a very dangerous boom and bust cycle. Um, that boom and bust cycle <coughs> can drag down not just the individual borrowers that are directly involved, but entire regions and indeed the entire world economy. And this is the most pressing problem. So at some level, if the Spanish government or the Peruvian government or Spanish banks or Peruvian banks borrow too much and get themselves in trouble, you know, you could be, I don't know if you'd call it moralistic or whatever, cold-hearted and say that's their problem. They made the mistakes, let them live with it. The problem we face is not that Spanish banks, Spanish government, Peruvian banks, Peruvian government um, made mistakes and got themselves in trouble, but that the problems that they created for themselves are transmitted throughout the world and can drag down entire regions and the entire world economy. This is what we saw in Europe, for example, or in the United States. I mean, the United States is probably the quintessential example. The, the, originally, when the crisis erupted at the end of 2007, during 2007, everybody around the world said, well, it's an American quote-unquote subprime crisis. Some of you will remember the crisis was originally called the subprime crisis. It was just an American thing and just a bunch of stupid American bankers lending it to stupid American borrowers. Who cares? It turned out to pull down the entire world economy. When the crisis first erupted in Greece, Europeans said, well, this is just a corrupt Greek government nothing to worry about, it ended up being transmitted throughout the entire European Union and pulling down the entire European economy. Right? So this is a, an example, a specific example of something that's well known. Uh, and a circumstance in which one country or one firm or one set of households can make decisions perfectly rationally that have powerful effects on the rest of the economy. Can, in other words, impose very serious negative externalities on others. Um, it's a, it's a when, when a German bank, when German banks or individual German banks decided to lend to Spanish banks, when Spanish banks decided to lend to Spanish households, when Spanish households decided to borrow, they didn't take into account, and they're not expected to take into account, the effects of their behavior on the European economy or the world economy. They don't take those things into account. And so what happens is you get what from a systemic standpoint would be excessive lending by the banks, excessive borrowing by the firms and households. By the same token, when New York or Michigan or Massachusetts banks lend money to Nevada or Florida or Arizona homeowners, they didn't take into account the fact that this would fuel a housing bubble in the U.S., which might eventually burst and bring down the entire U.S. economy. Individual US, New York banks or Massachusetts banks or Michigan banks have no incentive to think about the broader systemic implications of their behavior. That's the responsibility of the government. But there is no world government, so no one's taking into consideration what the effects of these things are at the global level. And we live today in a global financial system where problems in one region can be very rapidly transmitted around the world. Individual lenders and borrowers and individual lending and borrowing nations have no incentive to take into account the impact of their behavior on the international financial system. Right? So this, in some ways, one way of, to me, one way of thinking about this is by analogy. Back in the 18th, early 19th century, lending financial markets were very local. To the extent that there was any regulation, it was done typically by municipalities or in the United States by states. As financial markets became national, every country developed national financial regulators, recognizing that a panic in one, one state could be transmitted through, in the US case, could be transmitted through all the entire US economy. And we needed a national financial regulator to deal with the national financial problems. So national financial markets led to national responsibilities for monitoring and supervising what was going on. We now have global financial markets, but we have no global regulators. There's no global government. There's no one there to deal with the possibility of externalities, the possibility of these costs being imposed by one country's or one firm's or one market's behavior on others. So I think all of this implies, at least I infer, that there is a strong case for governments to work together to try to assess and attempt to address 
the potential implications of these large-scale international financial flows. In other words, we're not going to get a world government. No one thinks that there will be a world government anytime soon. But we can have cooperation among national governments to try to mitigate the effects of some of the, these trends that I've been talking about. And I think more and more people, certainly many regulators, many policymakers, many academics, think that some form of cooperation along these lines is fully justifiable. But we also have to ask whether it's politically feasible. That is, what, is it likely that governments are going to cooperate on these measures? Um, I used to be very skeptical. I used to think that there are very few incentives for national policymakers to take into account the impact of their behavior on other countries and to cooperate on these monetary and financial uh, actions. But I've become a lot more, op not a lot more, but a little more optimistic for two reasons. The first is that in the aftermath of the crisis, we've seen that politicians have paid a pretty serious price, price for not being alert to the possibilities of the crash. Virtually every government that was in office when the crisis hit was turned out of office. There are a few exceptions, but very, very few. So politicians in their own self-interest have some incentive to try to work through these problems and deal with them. Second cause for optimism is that in the aftermath of the crisis, there was, in fact, substantially more cooperation among major monetary authorities than certainly I had anticipated, and in fact, than most analysts had anticipated. When Lehman Brothers failed and the world financial markets froze in October of 2008, um, almost immediately, the world's major monetary authorities, the European Central Bank, the Fed, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of Canada, got together and worked out coordinated international monetary policies to try to address the crisis. And those, that, that cooperation stuck for years. Now, there were many other failures in economic policy making on the fiscal side, on many other sides, but in monetary policy, the major central banks worked quite closely together and have continued to work together on trying to develop some common framework for financial regulation. Now, we can criticize everything from the monetary policies to the financial regulatory policies, but the fact is, that really for the first time in post-war modern financial history, the major monetary authorities of all the big financial centers worked very closely together to confront a substantial economic crisis. So I think there is some cause for optimism. So those are my general thoughts. And they're somewhat tentative and somewhat halting, but let me summarize them. I think that recent experience demonstrates that today's international financial markets can create enormous opportunities. But they may also give rise to some very serious problems. And in particular, we can be pretty sure that this is not the last financial crisis we will face. There will be more cases in which the actions of borrowers, lenders, national governments create very serious problems for themselves and for others. There will be experience after experience of these kinds of international externalities in monetary and financial policies, they will certainly recur. We, and by we I mean analysts, policymakers, academics, and others, are still working through exactly what and how and, ha and what character future crises may have and how they might best be addressed. In other words, the contours of this very new, and very different, in many ways unprecedented international financial and economic order are not entirely clear. But I do believe that as those contours become clearer, we will see that there is a greater need for cooperation among the major governments on international monetary and financial policy. And I want to end on an optimistic note. I, I believe that we will also see a greater desire on the part of governments to undertake the difficult steps to achieve that cooperation. At least, I hope so. So let me end on an unusually positive note and turn to questions or comments. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just curious, one of the things you didn't touch 
John, were some very important recent developments. In particular, the collapse of energy and commodity prices over the past year, and maybe related to that, the adventures and the rise of the United States and Europe, uh, of uh, Russia, and political tensions elsewhere in the world. And is this going to complicate matters over the next couple of years? Right, so since I don't know if everybody could, could hear the question, let me just read it. But what, what's the impact of trends is perhaps the wrong word, but trends in energy price, whatever's happening in energy prices around the world. Commodities in general. Commodities in general, yes, right, the, the collapse of commodity prices. And the second is what are the potential implications of, um, of what do we call it, adventurous policies on the part of the Russian government. Um, first, the commodity, commodity prices. So this, to me, the commodity boom was part and parcel of the same phenomenon where very large scale flows of financial funds could contribute to increases in asset prices. Increases in prices of lots of things, including assets. Um, one of the things that was that I talked a little bit about Brazil and Peru, I'm just giving, giving them as, as examples. They were attractive to the international financial markets in large part because they were participating in this commodity boom. They were selling to the Chinese primarily. Right? So again, you have an uptick in commodity prices that makes certain economies look a lot better. Capital floods in, right? It then speeds up the economies more, cap more capital floods in, and so on and so forth. When commodity prices turn down, it exacerbates the, down, the, the downswing of the cycle. So I think that the volatility of commodity prices in some ways interacts with the extraordinary, the, the, today, the extraordinary availability of international financial flows to, to yet again, exacerbate the, the volatility. So that, I'm not sure if that's a, that's a general answer, not a specific answer. The question, I think the specific answer is, um, the current status, state of commodity markets is a big problem, especially for Latin America. Many Latin Americans had ascribed the relatively rapid, maybe too strong a word, but reasonably rapid growth of their economies to good economic management, to having resolved all of their problems, to having adopted the right reform measures, when in fact the principal reason was the commodity boom. And now they're waking up to the sad fact that the commodity boom was responsible for a large part of their rapid growth and that they're going to have to rethink, rethink their development model. I mean, all over Latin America, not all over, but in, in, in many of the major countries in Latin America, there is a really serious rethinking, Brazil being the most obvious case, of how to deal with the fact that you can no longer rely on constantly increasing and very high commodity prices. And uh, uh, a rediscovery of the fact that you can't build a vibrant developing country economy and hope to graduate into the ranks of the developed without diversifying out of the commodities and into other economic activities. So that's on the energy front. Russia, um, the, I've avoided talking about geopolitics and any of these political factors. The, you know, um, I think that on the one hand, the adventurism of the current Russian government probably is in some ways positive for initiatives to try to develop more constructive approaches to the European crisis because it gives many of European countries an incentive to try to make sure that they work things out. If you're sitting in the Baltic states or in Poland, right, you have a vested interest in making sure that Europe is solid and cohesive and on your side because you've got someone to your east that is very threatening. One of the reasons, unquestionably, that Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia joined the Euro is that it bound them more closely to the rest of the European Union with a very threatening eastern neighbor. Um, I see no prospect in the near future that Russia will be more cooperative with the West or with Europe. And I think that increases the stakes for overcoming the problems the European Union faces. Um, the, the best, the best uh, course of action, I guess I would say, the, the best one could hope, especially for Central and Eastern Europe, not so much for Western Europe, but for, Western, for Central and Eastern Europe, is a resolution of the crisis so that European integration can move forward again. Uh, forward movement in European integration is the best insurance for Poland's and, La and Baltic states and Bulgarias and Romanias of the world have against Russian aggression. Um, so I think that the two 
are closely linked. That is, that the process of European integration is closely linked to greater security for the member states of the European Union. So to what extent what happened in the Eurozone is capable of is indicate what, what probably will happen on a global scale. So you have all these capitalists of the world united, <laughs> right? And then no common, commonized monetary policy, even though you said there, there is some cooperation, and totally self-interested fiscal policy, naturally. Right, so to what extent does the world look like the Eurozone? Um, the difference is that, I mean, I guess there are two differences I would point to. The first is that the major blocks, if you want to call them that, maintain their own monetary policies. So the, the, one of the striking characteristics of the Eurozone, of course, is that very different countries had a common currency and therefore a common monetary policy. And as I pointed out, that, that tended, given that there were other flaws, if you will, in the construction of the Euro, that exacerbated the problems. Right? We have today an indication of how the fact that we don't have a common world currency has helped things. Because as the ECB has, under, has started to undertake quantitative easing of its own, that is to loosen monetary policy to try to get the region out of this terrible morass that it's in, the euro has dropped 25, 30%. And so has the yen against the dollar. And that will unquestionably help the recovery of those two, the, the European economy and the Japanese economy. It's not, not such great news for the US, but it's good for them. So one of the saving graces at the global level is that the major blocks still have autonomous monetary policies. They can use monetary policy. Another way of thinking about this is that typically we think of a national government as having two major tools of macroeconomic policy, fiscal policy and monetary policy. The member states of the Eurozone gave up monetary policy. And because their fiscal policies were not coordinated, to some extent they also had given up fiscal policy. The other major block, if you think of the, the Eurozone, dollar, you know, U.S., Japan, still have fiscal policy and maintain monetary policy. So that's sort of a saving grace. The, that's one, the one point. The second point is the one that you alluded to, which is I think there is a growing awareness, especially among monetary authorities, that there are really strong pressures for, and in some sense imperatives of, more coordinated monetary and financial policies. Now, I don't want to oversell this, but if we compare what the world looks like today to what it looked like 20 or 25 years ago, the level of cooperation among central banks, both on monetary policy and on financial regulation, is an order of magnitude greater. And that, I think, is a good thing, because what it means is that although these different these blocks can pursue their own independent monetary policies, they can at least coordinate on what they're trying to do and avoid the you know, what happened in the 1930s, which really was a currency wars, trade wars, financial wars, which ended up in shooting wars. So those are, I'm trying to get from this. Students? How about you? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I promised yeah. I wouldn't call on people in the front row, but I'll call on you. <laughs> okay, does the boom and bust cycle you were talking about and the internationalization of global financial markets contribute to or affect the convergence of the developed and developing countries, or does it disprove this theory? And what, uh, what role should the IMF play in regards to the international aid to, to countries that are in trouble, such as Argentina or right. Greece, when the worries of the debt default or debt? And, in general, as in Argentina, can affect the global economy in this way. Okay, so the first part of the question yeah. was, how does what I've been talking about affect the possibility of convergence, by right. which we mean catching up, right. of, catching up of poor countries in the boom and bust cycle? In the boom and bust cycle. And the second was the role of the IMF, both uh, really important aspects. On the first, I'll reiterate what I said before I and mean, try to expand on it. I think that. Um, international financial markets create enormous opportunities for developing countries because they make capital available for countries that are lacking in capital. I mean, in, in some sense, there's only one thing worse than borrowing too much and getting into a debt crisis, and that's not being able to borrow at all. And most countries in the developing world can't borrow a cent. <coughs> Sub-Saharan Africa, much of South Asia, much of, much of Southeast Asia, these are countries whose governments, whose firms cannot borrow anything into and that's a problem because if you, many of you may have, may have heard, may know of microfinance, there's these initiatives to make 
very small amounts of, of, of finance available to small farmers, uh, small business people, you know, shopkeepers, market uh, market owners, mostly women in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Um, the the the, one of the biggest problems that developing countries face is an absence of financial opportunities. So, you know, finance, in some sense, is essential to economic growth and development. Because what, what does finance, what does borrowing mean? It means that you're able to you're able to make investments that will increase your productivity, and therefore allow you both to pay back your loans and to be better off. Right? Every every virtually, I kind of think of that. I should say every. So let me say virtually every country I can think of that has developed successfully, including the United States, did so with substantial inflows of foreign finance. Mm -hmm. We financed our canals, our railroads, our mines, many of our factories by borrowing from the rest of the world. We were mm -hmm. And if you look at the real success stories of the last 40 years or so, the Koreas and Taiwans and others, they were heavy borrowers in the initial phases of their economic growth and development. And the countries that can't borrow really, in many ways, are stuck in a low-level equilibrium trap. If you can't borrow and you, can't, you don't have the resources of your own to finance new investments, you can be stuck for a long time. So I think there are great opportunities, but opportunities also involve risks. And, and I think the, the, I don't want to call it a trick, but the real question is, can the international system, to the extent that there is such a thing, find some way of making the opportunities available and reducing the risks. Right. So you mentioned the IMF. During World War II, the great powers came together and designed international institutions that they thought would make the opportunities available but reduce the risks. And they had some successes. But I think everyone would agree that the IMF and the World Bank have not been quite as successful as they might have been. There's a lot of talk these days about the reforms necessary in these, these so-called Bretton Woods institutions that might make them more effective, both at mobilizing capital for countries that need it, and at preserving or improving the level of cooperation among the major financial powers. At this point, a lot of those initiatives are stalled. And they're stalled, not to put too fine a point on it, but because of power. The IMF and the World Bank are essentially run by the rich countries. And they're under a lot of pressure from developing countries, Brazil, India, China in particular, to make those institutions more responsive to the needs of developing countries. But, you know, it's hard for those with power to give it up. And so I think that what's happening in the corridors of Washington, where the IMF is about to have its annual meetings, is a very gradual evolution towards an international monetary fund and a World Bank that will be more sensitive to the needs of developing countries. And if we're fortunate, and if the politicians can work it out, that we'll, that we'll be able to play a more constructive role in trying to get more capital to developing countries that need it right, under circumstances that are perhaps, you might say, fairer to them. So I think, again, I'm trying to be optimistic. All night, I'm trying to be optimistic. It's hard, it's hard to spend your life studying financial crises and remain optimistic, but I'm trying. Right? Um, and so I think that there are some glimmers of hope. A bunch of us were talking earlier today about the Chinese initiative, the initiative led by the Chinese to set up an international infrastructure bank, which the U.S. has not joined. Um, one, can, one can think what one wants about that initiative, but the fact is that it represents what you might think of as a democratization of the international financial system. Mm -hmm. You know, in 1960 or 1970 or even 1995, the international financial order was managed lock, stock, and barrel by the U.S., by North America, Western Europe, and Japan. No one can say that today. No one can seriously talk about international financial and monetary affairs and management without taking into account the Chinese, the Indians, the Brazilians, um, the developing world. And that's a good thing. Um, speaking again on, I believe it's called the Redevelopment Bank, is the bank that you were speaking The Chinese, the, yes, oh, yeah. the Asian, in, in, Asian in, Asia Infrastructure Investment. Yes. Right. Um, how do you feel that this new development bank, because these European countries are such huge investors in the IMF and in the World Bank, how do you think that this sort of competitor that's coming up is going to affect uh, Europe's restoration process? Right, so the, the question is, will the Asian Infrastructure Bank Infrastructure Investment Bank, will it affect, how will it, or how might it affect European recovery? Yeah. I think it won't have much of an impact on Europe. Right? 
it's because it's, it's not competing with Europe for capital. And the Europeans actually have signed on. Most of the Europeans have signed on. The U.S. is not, but most of the Europeans have. The, the principal purpose of the bank, as I understand it, it's not, it's in formation, so we don't really know what, uh, what, what it's going to end up doing. But, but my understanding is its principal purpose is to make development finance available, especially for infrastructure projects, on terms which are less stringent, we might say, and less controlled by the developed countries than is currently the case with the World Bank. Uh, again, some of us were talking earlier today, and well, that sounds like a wonderful thing. But one of the things it means is that this is a bank that, unlike the World Bank, might make loans that don't take into account things like impact on the environment, um, human rights, democracy. You know, so the World Bank's been under a lot of pressure from, the, from American, European, other activists to democratize lending, to make sure that it's environmentally safe, that, to make sure that it's accountable to local populations. That's not a really popular po policy in a lot of developing countries. It's especially not popular in China, but it's not popular in a lot of developing countries. So the principal purpose of this bank, as I understand it, is to try to move away from some of those conditionalities and make funds available on, on terms that developing countries will find more forgiving, let's say. As, it, as for whether it affects the European, the, the European problem, I would say it's, it's orthogonal to it. It's not directly related. It, it may help in some indirect sense in that it might provide some goodwill on the part of developing countries towards the Europeans, certainly some goodwill on the part of the Chinese towards the Europeans, and the Europeans are desperate to develop China as a market. I mean, it's, the Germans are desperately searching for new markets now that they've lost much of the European market, which is in, in, in recession. So in that sense, it might help, but, but the direct effects will not be able to it, not be strong. Yeah, to avoid a crisis of this magnitude in the future with Europe, are they looking at the extremes of you know, a united fiscal policy throughout Europe versus, you know, dissolution of the euro completely? So, the question was, uh, in response to the crisis, are they thinking of extreme measures, and the two extreme measures, very reasonably stated, are a consolidation of some common European fiscal policy on the one hand, which would be sort of making Europe like the United States, or just dissolving the euro. Dissolving the euro, I think, is not in the cards. And, and I alluded before to the very strong reasons why Europeans have been insistent on the desirability of a single currency. So let me say a little bit about that because I, I find that there is often misunderstanding. So, you, so we get to the end of this talk about how terrible things are in Europe and how the euro was designed so poorly and it all came crashing down. And so, you know, a logical question is, who needs it? You know, if you walk into a disaster, you know, you walk out again. Um, but the reality is that it's not so simple. And there are two very strong reasons why the member states of the European Union have been so insistent on a common currency. The first is a purely economic one, and that is that there is a lot of evidence that sharing a common currency is a dramatic um, precipitant of or, or facilitator of cross-border trade and investment. Right? So the Europeans have a single market for goods and capital. But there, again, there is increasing empirical evidence, and I could cite some studies for you, that having a common currency has a bigger impact on cross-border trade and cross-border investment than the kinds of single market treaties that the Europeans have signed. I'll give you a specific instance. There's a Roberto Rigo one at MIT, and his colleagues have uh, a project called the Billion Prices Project, which actually they're up to about five billion prices. And so they use scanner data. So you can, you can, in this era of big data, you can get scanner data from like thousands of supermarkets around the world. So they have, they literally have billions of prices from countries all over the world. And they've compared them. And, and looking at Europe, they asked the question, where are prices the same? And where do they move together? Right? So if you look in the United States, uh, tube of toothpaste pretty much costs the same everywhere in the United States. And if the tube of toothpaste goes up 10 the same brand. If it goes up 10% in New York, it's going to go up 10% in Boston, et cetera, et cetera. So they look in Europe, and what they find is that if the countries in Europe have currencies that bounce around against each other, then only 3% of the prices move together. If the currencies are locked together, like the Danish currency and the euro, they move together about 6% of the time. Within the eurozone, they move together 65% of the time. 
So for all intents and purposes, the Eurozone has created a common set of prices which move together in the same way that prices move in the United States. And that's a tremendous economic, a tremendous economic fillip to economic integration. So you might think of it as the Euro facilitates, encourages globalization, integration of the European economies in a way that really no treaties can. Right? Because with the common uh, currency, which makes it so easy to move across borders, for firms to invest across borders, for goods to travel across borders, you get an integration of the market that cannot be achieved without a common currency. That's the, the belief, and there is increasing evidence for that. There's a second reason, which is a political economy reason. It is very difficult to sustain a single market if members of that single market have different currencies. And I'll give you two examples. One example is Mercosur, which is the, so otherwise known as the Southern Common Market, created in 1994 by Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay. Mainly Brazil and Argentina, no offense to Paraguay and Uruguay, but mainly Brazil and Argentina. At the time Mercosur was created, Brazil and Argentina had pegged their currencies to the US dollar at a one-to-one -one parity. So a peso was equal to a real was equal to a dollar. Mercosur was created, trade barriers come down, and trade explodes between Brazil and Argentina. And everybody is enthusiastic about Mercosur. This is going to be a common market for Brazil and Argentina. It's going to make a huge market, big difference. In 1999, the Brazilians devalued their currency by 40% against the peso. And when they did that, Argentina was flooded with cheap Brazilian products, and the Argentines couldn't sell their products in, in, in Brazil. In response, Argentine producers demand the trade barriers Pulling out of Mercosur, the Argentine government threatened to impose emergency tariffs, and the Brazilians had to, quote unquote, voluntarily restrict their exports to Argentina to keep Mercosur from breaking up. In 2001, the Argentine pesos got its turn, and it collapsed against the Real, and you had a flood of Argentine products into Brazil. And basically, Mercosur is a dead letter. And it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not too much of one to say that the progress of economic integration in Mercosur was halted by currencies moving against each other. Because in each of the member states, it was said, <coughs> what, what point, what's the point of having a common market if that country can just devalue its currency and get a competitive advantage against us every, every time it wants to? Remember, in, I don't know remember, a basic principle of macroeconomics is a 10% depreciation is exactly identical to a 10% tariff and 10% export subsidy. So if you can't impose tariffs, but you can devalue, doing the same thing. This happened in 1992-93 in Europe. In the, the, in the 80s and into the early 90s, the Europeans locked their exchange rates against the Deutsche Mark. So they had a European monetary system where exchange rates were fixed against one another, and they adopted a single market. So they mo removed all barriers to trade. Everybody's happy after 87. The single market is working. Currencies aren't moving. Then the currency crisis hits. A currency crisis hit in 1992 because of German unification. Too much to go into. But for, take my word for it, currency crisis hits. And a bunch of European countries, especially Spain and Italy, devalue 20, 25% against the franc and the Deutsche Mark. And a flood of Spanish and Italian imports flood into Germany and, and France. And the German and French governments are facing massive political protests from their industries. And the French government actually threatened to impose 20% tariffs on Italian and Spanish goods in a single market, which would be like if the state of Michigan threatened to impose a 20% tariff on Wisconsin products. You, couldn't have, you can't have a single market if the member states are imposing tariffs on one another. So the political economy part of the story is that it's hard to imagine a single market with separate currencies that move around against each other. So that was all to explain why, why the Europeans are sorry. And I can't even remember the question. Um, so the first was, why, that's, that's the dissolution of the euro. OK, I, now I remember. And so the, then the other side was fiscal coordination. Well, you know, if you read your textbooks, you'll find that economic analysts have very simple solutions to these problems. It's very, very simple. All you need to do is what we do in the US. We have a single market and a common currency. And we have a fiscal federalist policy, which means that automatically, if one region of the country is doing badly, it gets money from the federal government. And it's transferred from the regions that are doing well. And we don't have to pass any laws. It's just the way it works. Because if a region is doing badly, so if unemployment is 15% in Nevada, then tax revenue from Nevada goes way down. They're, not, they're paying less into the feds. 
they're getting more unemployment insurance, they're getting more welfare, Medicare, Medicaid, and the prosperous parts of the country are transferring money to the, um, the parts of the country that are in trouble. And so it works fine here. You, know? we did, you didn't see Americans saying, as we could have said, you know, why should we in Massachusetts, we didn't have a housing bubble, we lent these people out money and they wasted it. Why should we be bailing out those lazy Nevadans and lazy South Floridians? Right? <laughs> didn't see that because it's one country in the fiscal federal union. So why can't they do it? Well, it took a long time for us to get there. <laughs> By most standards, we didn't have a common currency until 1863. Right? We had competing state currencies for much of the 18, much of the period from the 1820s to the 1860s. Right? Common currency, we didn't have a central bank until 1913. We didn't have fiscal federalism until, depending on how you count, the 1930s or maybe the 1960s. So it took us 150, 200 years to get to the point where we had a fully functioning fiscal federal union. <coughs> Europeans have been in it for a lot less time. So, and it's a very difficult thing to, to, to manage. I mean, another component part of this and something to keep in mind is if you're in the Eurozone, your government in the Eurozone, you've given up one of the two major levers of macroeconomic policy, monetary policy. You're really going to give up the only lever that remains, fiscal policy? That means the government's irrelevant. How many politicians want to make themselves irrelevant? <laughs> How many people would like to no, politic? <laughs> uh, so it's bit, but 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 to be serious about it, think think of it not from the standpoint of a venal and corrupt politician, but of a politician who wants to serve his people. Right? Who says, I can't give up fiscal policy. I can't delegate this. I can't rely on the European Union to pursue a fiscal policy that's right for the Portuguese people, or the Greek people, or the or the you know whatever the, the Spanish people. <coughs> If, if, if I let Brussels set the fiscal policy for Spain, they're going to starve us. They're going to be influenced by the Germans. The Germans are the biggest elephant in the China shop. No, no. Bull. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so, you're trying to shut me up. Yes, I'm trying. <laughs> I have one last question, if I may, please. Of course. The United Kingdom. You haven't talked about the UK and its relationship. And the, the movement today that uh, they would like to secede from the EU, <laughs> right. and what impact that might have, if any. Right. So, the United Kingdom. Um, UK finds itself in a very difficult position, I would say, which is, on the one hand, it has benefited very substantially from many of the component parts of European integration, especially the creation of a single market. Um, European, uh, British firms, British banks have played a massively important role in the creation of a single market. And the, Euro the British economy, to a large extent, has been quite substantially reoriented towards Europe, away from the Commonwealth and towards Europe. On the other hand, for both economic and probably cultural and political reasons, the, Brit the common market, the European Union, is not popular in Britain. Um, a simple explanation of this, simple, well, one of the explanations for this, is that Britain remains probably the least European-oriented economy in Europe. Still has strong ties with the Commonwealth. Still has strong ties with the United States. Um, it's a larger share of its economic activity is oriented to outside the European Union, Union than any other European Union member. So there's a pull in the opposite direction. That then is exacerbated or exaggerated by the fact that if we think of the panoply of policies that are being decided by the European Union, or that might be decided in the future, health and safety regulations, financial regulations, maybe even things like welfare, pensions, unemployment, um, immigration, Europe, is, uh, England, Great Britain, is very far away from the median European voter. Right? So, you know, in, in some sense, the the preferences of the average British citizen are very different from those of most continental Europeans. Right? Uh, ironically, the preferences of Irish citizens are closer to those of European citizens. Uh, yeah, that's why one of the reasons Ireland is a very enthusiastic, a Euro-enthusiastic country. Um, so, so I think my reading and talking with people um, is that both the British business community and the British political elite very much wants to stay in the European Union. They do not want to be part of the Euro, and they will resist any attempt to join it. But that's all right, that's already been decided. But they definitely want to stay in the European Union. The problem is they face an increasingly polarized electorate, 
with, at this point, at the, in the most recent European Parliament elections, the, the biggest party, not the, not the majority, but the biggest party was the so-called United Kingdom Independence Party, which is an explicitly anti-EU party. So Labour and the, and the Tories face a challenge, really, from their right. It's a little bit like the Tea Party in the US, different set of policies. They face a very serious challenge from their right, which is pulling them towards more and more Eurosceptical views. But my reading of this is that you know some of it's dominated by the crisis. Britain had a very serious crisis as well as we did, and they've come out of it, but very slowly. Some of it's character dominated by the underlying feeling that Europe is going in a direction that many Britons do not like. But I do think that both the business community, most of the labor movement, and the two the two main political parties remain of the belief that staying in is better than leaving. And that's my analysis. Okay, I'll show. Well, you have been a very good audience. And uh, Jeff has been a very engaging speaker. If you want to take home a copy of what he said, on the outside are copies of his new book, Currency Politics. And after I hand him this award, the value of that autograph copy will increase exponentially. You can sell it on eBay for more than you paid for it. This I'd like to see that. I'm going to take this moment to present to Professor Jeffrey Freeman the Alice Connor Gordon Memorial Award for Excellence in the Field of International Economics by the School of Business Administration at Open University, dated April 2002.